Did you know that the rituals are still taking place inside the chambers of the Great Pyramid? Or that the so-called ancient Egyptian historic heritage doesn't even belong to the modern country of Egypt? Or that the pyramid that you see here is not even the actual important historic site at hand? This episode, as usual, will cover a very wide variety of topics and most of them again will be important and yet they will be under the radar, so to say. If we limit our scope of search with questions like what model of lasers did the aliens use to drill these holes in the stones, then actually we may miss the main point. Because we will never understand the mentality of the people who built all this. And that's why we'll not find out also how did they build it. They were simply not obsessed with tools like us. So how did they build these huge pyramids and temples? Let's have a close look at the actual building blocks. What on earth is this? Very oddly shaped building blocks. So did they really shape them like uh, with, with tools to have these strange uh, uh, forms and fit with each other in such a manner? Hard to believe. Now, let's select a more neat-looking spot. At first glance, this may look like standard shape, form, blocks, but if you pay attention at the places where they meet, marked with red lines, you will actually notice that we are talking about uh, not very obvious, but definitely polygonal stone masonry because the surfaces between the blocks are non-standard, they don't repeat each other, and yet the blocks match. In case we are talking about hewn work, yeah, with tools, it would barely make any sense, because they will have to shape each and every block individually to fit so many others around with a unique shape, and uh, taking into consideration the complexity which would that involve and to add to all this the number of the stones I think the conclusion of all this would be that no sensible person would incur such a misery upon himself but if we assume that this was cast or grown then everything will make much more sense as far as casting the best source for more information is the absolutely brilliant work of the French scholar Davidovitz, which includes testing samples and even demonstration videos showing practically how could whatever has been cast could have been done relatively easily using free or cheap, readily available natural materials found in abundance in the Nile Delta. And to avoid any misunderstanding about the work of the Vidovits, it's very important to note that he does not claim that all the pyramids and temples of the land of Osiris were cast out of Geopolymer, but only part of them. So the work of the Vidovits is not a solution to all mysteries. It will only help us, maybe, to put the puzzle together. And very often people show inclusions of um, shells of marine animals included in the stone and they claim that this debunks the claims of Davidovich. No, they do not debunk his work because, first of all, what was the problem of uh, using this type of material in their mixture, there is no problem. They could have just put it and then cast with such a mixture. Or the samples which are shown with such uh, 
shells of marine animals, etc. They could be hewn stone indeed. Don't forget that the Vidovich doesn't claim that all the stonework in the land of Osiris was cast, just part of it. Here we see uh, remains of ancient mortar between the stones. It looks exactly like the stones. Apparently they knew very well how to prepare such a mixture. The very shape of countless building blocks really leaves the impression that they were molded and not hewn. Doesn't this look to you like a stroke left in a soft material? It does, so the stone could have been softened or this line could have been drawn during the casting when the mixture was not yet hardened. So stone softening is a very popular topic, but we should not be narrow-minded and assume that in all scenarios we had a stone and then it got softened in a magical way. No, maybe it was much simpler. We had a soft mixture. Also, many sacred sites have um, very interesting floors, perfectly leveled. So, the standard way this mystery is formulated is what kind of lasers did they use to level it in such a digital way? Maybe they used alien technology, but maybe they simply poured the mixture. According to some people who have done field studies, such floors fit so well with the curvy terrain below that talking about uh, hewn stone in this case is simply inappropriate. Now, casting is not the only way to have soft and easily manageable stone. Growing is yet another option. To understand what I'm talking about, please watch this video of mine. It's a corner store important video for a lot that you will hear in my videos from this date on September 2017. Sadly, this video about uh, growing stone in ancient times didn't at all attract the attention which I expected it would do. Although the information in it is extremely important, it wasn't uh, appealing to that many people. I noticed this psychological effect that um, if uh, something that I present has anything to do with aliens or reptilians, it just so much resonates with everybody. Although the concept of uh, growing stone and growing buildings is far more exotic and mystically colored compared to the, the stories of the greys and the reptilians, people simply didn't uh, even grasp the full story around it because they're programmed from the mass media even about what is what mystical should be so that's why i found this amazing image of these um, interesting creatures hopefully people will pay attention what kind of uh, stone uh, stickers they have around their heads. Was that also hewn? Or glued? Unlikely, I would say. It looks more like something that has been pasted over, layered over. Now, hopefully, by the magical aura of these sacred snakes, finally my message will get around. But all these could have been grown stone Paste. This is again the desert of Egypt. Again, we see the typical stone balls. This was grown stone. I would say at this point 99% sure. Is it really by chance that we see such stone balls in the vicinity of the magnificent uh, 
ancient constructions in the land of Osiris, did some um, stone spores, stone seeds fall here by chance, carried by the wind? That is possible, but also it is possible that here stone was grown or experiments were done with growing stone and later this material or the knowledge of the experiments was implemented in growing things, growing buildings, using material readily found below the feet of the builders. And by the way, don't you find it a bit odd the way this pyramid has been stripped of its casing? Allegedly by simple folks who did not understand its historic value and were just hungry to get building materials for their homes. If that was really the case, would they climb high in the skies and remove the casing over there and leave the most easily accessible casing on, at ground level? And why would they go after the casing only anyway, if they were just looking for any building material which is easily accessible? What about the countless standard size blocks at the bottom of the pyramid. They basically lay loose, they are waiting for looters to take them. But instead of that, these allegedly uncivilized looters, they went for oddly shaped blocks, which are much harder to access. And these blocks, because of their odd shape and supposedly harder variety of stone, they will be much harder to use in common construction of simple homes. Or was it really savage looters who removed the casing? Or was it controlled demolition? Because in the previous episode we heard about historic testimonials that the full pyramid was covered with very, very ancient writings. Was this actually an organized looting? organized for the purpose to remove the uncomfortable for those who organized it writing on the pyramid. So it seems the Great Pyramid of Giza is a fully functional site for magic rituals. The tourists are allowed only daytime and at night time heavily armed guards make sure that the public has no access. So I found out from a young Russian man, a very intelligent young boy, who lived some two years, I believe, in um, Alexandria, that for sure at night there are initiation rituals in the Great Pyramid and you can sign up if you pay a really large amount of money. Now, this young man, he was so fascinated with the mysteries of the land of Osiris that he packed and uh, went to live in Alexandria. He learned the local language, he made friends with the guards of various sites. He really became an insider as much as that is possible for an ordinary mortal from their point of view. And who are they? Well, uh, in this particular story with the initiations that are taking part at night, they refused. Uh, he, he found people who are connected with this network which provides such special offers, but uh, they didn't even want to give him the price quote because for them it was uh, obvious that he will not have the required budget anyway. And another interesting piece of information, which is not only from him, also other people have uh, 
tried to have friendly conversations with the guards. So it seems this uh, historic heritage in this sacred land of Osiris doesn't even belong, is not even managed by the current Egyptian government. So in the past couple of uh, decades and centuries, many things were discovered and studied in Egypt. And nowadays it's kind of, hmm, not so much, maybe we found everything already. In reality, there are active excavations uh, going on and things are being taken from the ground. The premises which cannot be taken out, they are being locked up. And what happens to the artifacts as reported by the guards who work there? During the day, they excavate them and in the evening, the truck comes with a person from the American embassy. And he gets sure that everything is labeled and barcode and packed properly in very durable boxes, which are being loaded onto the truck, after which the packed artifacts disappear from ever from the public domain. So there seems to be some sort of a metal lid on the top of the head of the Sphinx. So I really wonder why don't we get more information and images of uh, what is in there. If it was uh, just an innocent cavity for uh, putting on some sort of a hat on top of the Sphinx, for example, then uh, why don't we find more details about it? So, at every step we're being assured that we are discovering more and more, we know more and more about these ruins, and yet in the not so far away past, people had free access, and here we see them climbing out of that hole, while we at the same time, the better knowing ones, we are not even allowed to take aerial photography of it, what to speak of getting there in person. So, all excavations in research at the Giza Plateau are currently straightforwardly banned by law in Egypt, presumably for the sake of their conservation. But then how would an image capturing a quadcopter flying in the vicinity would damage the sites? It doesn't. Well, that's why they invented another explanation. Aerial and drone photography and flying drones for any reason is absolutely forbidden in Egypt. And the explanation given on their official web page is that the terrorists apparently are using lots of drones. And apparently they are doing it even though it's illegal to do it. What a surprise, my god! I always thought these are law-abiding citizens. What a shock they don't follow the laws. So when we read mainstream so-called scientific publications on how these uh, marvelous temples and structures were built, we will find amazing details, like how many slaves were involved in the construction and where was the garden for growing garlic for them, to feed them. And as far as the techniques used, oh, I mean, you will find so many of them, you can choose the one you prefer. But for some unknown, to the most people, reason, they fail to give us any detail about an interesting experiment of how to build a much smaller replica of uh, these glorious pyramids. So a high-tech Japanese corporation attempted to make a much smaller replica, as you can see from the extremely poor photograph or sketch of one of the Egyptian pyramids. And instead of documenting this uh, very well and showing it on TV to really give uh, people good laugh, because this will make you, like, roll under the chair. Since initially the Japanese were indeed trying to employ building techniques, which were supposed to be the genuine ones used in antiquity, they, they failed at the start. They couldn't even get their stones across the river, what to speak of anything else. Gradually, as they realized how pathetically laughable their miserable endeavors are, 
They abandoned the initial project, at least to make it look less shameful. But the terrain was so difficult to get the stones uh, to the actual site that even modern technology like trucks, they had a difficulty traversing it. So eventually they had to resort to using uh, the lightest variety of stone they could use. And as far as carrying it, at the end they had to employ even helicopters. Because one thing is to make a demonstration of a stone pulling for 10 or 20 meters. And entirely another thing is to cope with kilometers of local terrain. And that's why there are barely any images available to testify about this extremely shameful for the penguins project. Better people don't hear about it anymore so that uh, their time can be wasted with all kinds of nonsense like uh, cutting hard varieties of stone with copper. Although other penguins already proved that such a method of cutting would leave behind hills of copper because that many copper tools would have been wasted during such a heroic cutting. Or they waste people's times with uh, fairy tales of all kinds of uh, silly ramps, which would have made it very easy to build all this. And as usual, the penguins absolutely forget to mention that uh, building some of their fantasy ramps would be more difficult than building the pyramids themselves. Param Sachirananda Rupam Rasatunda Lamba Kule Vajaman Yashoda Bio Lukalada Vamanam Paramishamatanda Kojutavam One aspect of the Egyptian megaliths doesn't seem to get the attention it deserves. And that's what uh, is described by many as uh, enormous paved platforms around the standing megalithic sites. People describe them as being considerably larger, consisting of considerably larger stones than the megalithic structures themselves. And this is evident from the photographs as well. Indeed, some of them tend to have uh, dimensions similar to the stones at Baalbek, that huge. Probably they are not being noticed that much simply because they lay on the ground. But the fact that they lay on the ground doesn't explain how did they end up over there. Moreover, the areas which have been paved in such a manner seem to be pretty large. Like this is on the way while driving to the actual historic sites, at least officially. And all this on the right is it the remains of a destroyed platform? And this seems to be like all over the place. Here on the left and maybe on the right. And images like this really make me wonder. Okay, these are cracks in the stone, probably. But then what about these two very regular and parallel lines? On one side, they doesn't resemble cracks in their shape and on the other if there are spaces between the blocks then what kind of unhumanly big blocks are these anyway?
Okay, now let's try to get to the important stuff. What do you see here? An emblematic Egyptian pyramid named after its alleged creator, the pharaoh Jose. Yeah, a bit impressive in size of over 60 meters or something like that. And the commonly found information about it here, built, wow, more than 4,000 years ago. Isn't it impressive? Although the credibility of the official dates is uh, hovering somewhere around zero, still the way it is presented to people, like you open any resource and immediately with the first sentence it, it starts with such a clarity and you see they even know the exact year, so immediately such a resource gains authority and people buy it. People believe these things, they fall for them. Or if they don't fall in this trap, they will just look at the structure and uh, yeah, it's not particularly uh, high tech. I mean, this could have been done without aliens. So what's the point? Skip it. Let's look for something interesting. And that's how people skip naively the entrance to an underground world, literally. The pyramid on the top is nothing, it's just a minor entry to underground city of at least three levels. We don't even know how big it is because the access to it is like extremely limited. We don't know if we see 1% or even less. But even from what the Russian group could see over there, there are three levels like three stories of this city and the deepest one is some 30 meters below ground level. Everything is cut in the bedrock. Before it got sealed down for the public and for researchers, few maps were made which don't match at all with each other. Here in this video you can uh, find all details of what kind of dead ends did the Russians face anywhere they uh, tried to visit or to obtain any information or on what is locked by whom and why. There are currently excavations going on, none of the information is published. They bribed one of the guards who gave them a a shot of the map used by the people who dig and that had nothing to do with uh, the public maps available. The only thing they could find out so far is that it is the size of a city, endless corridors and halls and objects and structures, the exact application of which would be highly unclear and actually uh, the normal guards of the site, even they have access to very, very limited area. Basically, they guard the entrance, but they're, even they are not allowed to see what's inside. They could find an information about experiment which was conducted not exactly from this underground city, but another one. They um, actually poured water in a tunnel, which they suspected ends up at the Giza pyramid. And the water did come out on the other side. Now, the distance covered by the water was 600 kilometers. Now, this underground complex, an entire city, below the relatively modest for Egyptian standards pyramid is just one of the many examples. I picked it up randomly. There are other underground complexes in the land of Osiris. But the most people, they don't even uh, get to the point of hearing what is the main point of the full site. They are shown the gate, which is the relatively simple pyramid on the top and then the real thing inside the size of a city this doesn't even get to the discussion table 
And this is not because uh, the people are innocent uh, victims of uh, some sort of a gang which uh, hides things from them without people's consent. No, it is the people we voluntarily elect. And they will continue doing it because that's their nature. They are not going to change. If any change is about to come, it has to come from our side. And the only way is to stop being so superficial when we vote. So all these endless uh, corridors of this and many other underground uh, structures in the land of Osiris, these are clearly not residential quarters. Their shape doesn't at all resemble some sort of a simple hiding place as well, what to speak of the size. Some parts of them could be blamed to have been burial chambers, but this is usually an exception. So from what we can conclude from the whatever translations we can make of the hieroglyphs, this seems to be some sort of places for magical rituals. In modern language, that would be like harvesting cosmic energies, which is the very same thing. And many people are just curious and want to know more about how to use these cosmic energies, but don't understand a basic rule in this game, which is that these energies are conscious themselves, and they deliberately choose to hide from us, because we think that we are good people and we have good intentions, but the deities, the masters of this energy, they don't think so. And if you don't believe me, hopefully you will believe a top-level magician, and that's about to come later in this video. This is the pyramid at Abu Rawash. Not so many people visit. The entry fee seems to be extremely high. It is definitely worth seeing, because the insides are laid barren, exposed. Either the full thing never got completed, or it was destroyed. This site is a good illustration of what kind of rock cutting was going on in the land of Osiris. Now, the underground part is obviously very, very deep, and above ground level, six meters of the pyramid, there are rock cut. Uh, with some stones glued on the sides to give it some sort of visually pleasing shape. Basically, a very wide trench was uh, dug out around the pyramid, and that's why the impression is created that it is. it starts at ground level. Actually, it doesn't. It starts some six meters below ground level, but the level, the platform around it is so big that the impression is created that the pyramid stands at ground level. And again, it is just one of the countless examples of uh, rock cutting in Egypt. There is much more. Architectural style of some of the rock cut stuff in the land of Osiris definitely resembles the styles of what I have been referring to as the Deronquio style rock cut ruins, like for example this rectangular pool, and even more noticeably things like this. I mean, this is like one to one a so-called Etruscan rock cut tomb, or 
Lycian from Turkey. Here more typically Etruscan so-called rock tombs, but in Egypt. And since most people have been already successfully brainwashed that rock cut means primitive, this makes it very easy to just lock up everything and people seem to be okay with that. Next I'm gonna review two very popular modern ideas. First of all, that there was an advanced ancient civilization which uh, came to an end somehow. And then the dynastic pharaohs, they built their pyramids on the top of the ruins which they inherited. And the second one is that uh, it's very similar. It's kind of an addition to the first idea and it's uh, about the allegedly water erosion on the Sphinx, which um, allegedly points to the fact that it is at least 12,000 years old. Let's start with the first concept that there were advanced beings, somehow they disappeared and then when the familiar and known, allegedly, <coughs> Uh, dynasties of ancient Egypt came, they just made a use of the ruins they found. This idea has gained lots of popularity because it is simplistic. People don't have to strain their minds, so they accept it. It sounds somewhat better than the usual penguin nonsense, so let's go for this. Now, as far as uh, confirmations from the actual historic sites about this scenario, there are close to zero. Indeed, exactly the opposite is to be observed. We see a gradual devolution, gradual loss of knowledge, coming in various layers rather than the high-tech stuff below and then strictly one simple layer on the top. Actually, in some cases, um, the Russians who spend their really lots of time, big groups, they go regularly, they really study meticulously. And from them I have heard that the situation is really not as simple. In some cases, they said, we see a pyramid of really raw mud bricks as primitive as you can imagine. And then on the top of that, you have a casing which is high-tech, like sparkling, polished, perfect gaps between the stones. Or in other cases, and I've been showing that in previous videos, we have in the same structure, next to each other, uh, stones, half of them are high-tech and half of them are like uh, really primitive. And it's not that uh, they're side by side, not the better ones on the lower layer. Baalbek is yet another site where this type of situation is clearly visible. High-tech work next to really stones with chisel marks. Another example, one out of the many. In this video, a sarcophagi or whatever box uh, is shown. It's made of a basalt and it's very smoothly polished. Now, this is a very hard stone. It, there is no way this type of polishing and precision of work could have been achieved with the tools attributed to dynastic Egypt. And yet the person depicted is with typical dynastic Egyptian looks. In reality, all this confusion arises from our naive trust in the mainstream history. We just blindly believe them that dynastic Egypt was the way they tell us and that's why they could not have created these things. In reality, if we stop believing the liars and uh, realize that the times of dynastic Egypt were radically different from what we were misled to believe, then that will be the first step in finding out the history, the true history of this period. Okay, next. Is the Sphinx at least 12,000 years old because of the water erosion marks on it? First of all, are these typical water erosion marks? Yes, most definitely they are. But yet, on sites like Petra, we see 
Typical water erosion marks and yet in one of the previous videos I showed you the river of stone caught petrified as it was flowing. So what kind of weapon or power did melt the stone and at the same time leave also typical water erosion marks? I don't know, but the conclusion is not everything that is Typical water erosion is surely water erosion. Second, is the Sphinx older than the pyramid? Well, most obviously, it appears that uh, it has been dressed with pyramid-style stone blocks after it eroded. But this comparison by itself is uh, almost meaningless as such, because the pyramid itself it has numerous layers of repair, some of which could be much more recent than we are inclined to think. For example, we have preserved wood. I'm not sure if this photograph is exactly from the Great Pyramid, but it's definitely from structures dating to that period. And I mean, of course the Sphinx is uh, in general much older than the pyramid or at least its part above ground because a rock cut is usually always older than uh, stuff built out of blocks. But again, the Sphinx being older than the pyramid by itself is uh, kind of useless for providing absolute dating in terms of years because in reality we know very little about the dating of the pyramid itself, and it is even more complicated because of its numerous layers. Next point. Now, let's assume that this is indeed water erosion only, and it is a result of rainfall, although there are other theories that uh, erosion like this can be observed even without water in the desert, but anyhow, this is irrelevant. How do we know that the last period with uh, rainfalls was 12,000 years ago? Definitely we don't know about that. I mean, the mainstream sources contradict each other to such an extent about this that to take it as a genuine coin is, is absurd. Next point. If you visit this, by the way, very rich and wonderful online resource of images, you can browse various albums with old photographs of um, the land of Osiris from the time when the sites were not yet ravaged by the modern restorators and conservators. And if you spend a couple of days browsing them, as I did, you will notice that on uh, many <coughs> temples there is very similar erosion and they definitely belong to a much later period. For example, uh, there was an alley of ram sphinxes on both sides. Actually, there are many such valleys, not just the famous one in Luxor. So that alley had rows of rams on both sides. And the left side was very well preserved, as all, all the other normal sphinxes and rams we see, while the left side, it had a level of erosion like the sphinx. So that's also a point to consider. And one last point about the sphinx being older than 12,000 years ago. Well, what was the weather 12,000 years ago? We have no clue. But we know for sure that the official story is a deliberate lie. Yes, heavily sponsored with bribes and forcing scientists to sign things they don't really mean, as I have covered in previous videos. I mean, how would we believe them? How was it 12,000 years ago if they are obviously lying of how it was even hundreds of years ago? So as a conclusion, the Sphinx is old, but this doesn't mean it's 12,000 years old. There is no proof about that at all, except the honest word of the penguins. Do you believe them? If you still do, even a little bit, let me tell you what scams they run with this allegedly ancient artifact. The bust of Nefertiti is made of limestone covered with plaster, a very soft material. And yet they expect us to believe that it laid 
in the ground for 3360 years exactly and then was found in this pristine condition just compare it with this bust made of harder material dated to the very same period and on the top of that excavated from an area with uh, way more favorable conditions for preservation namely much less humidity the bust of nefertiti was uh, found in a workshop practically on the shore of the nile so they expect us to believe that it was soaked in mud and water for 3360 years and then it came out brand new in addition to this when modern imagery devices were invented which allowed to see inside things without destroying them it became clear for those who examined that the broken off ear is a an attempt to artificially age the item. The tests showed that these damages were actually in, uh, caused on the ear during, in, in very recent times, at the times when it was uh, allegedly restored after being found. Very similar situation with the eye. The eye is actually encrusted from a different material. So, since it was made as a forgery, they made only one eye to make it look like it has been damaged. But when the latest penetrating uh, imagery devices were used, they found out that uh, the eye with the missing encrust, encrust was never meant to receive such encrust because that... Uh, would involve uh, drilling a hole in it to insert it like the eye which had the encrust. So here they are assuring us that this is a genuine artifact because it has been found in this workshop of this ancient sculptor. But uh, when the previous points surfaced, and not from alternative history researchers but by mainstream scientists themselves, they tried to find out, let's see where are the actual records of finding anything like this where they say it has been found. And um, it turned out that during these excavations, really such excavations existed, everything was meticulously documented day by day, along with uh, sketches and uh, full descriptions. There was no mention of such artifact at all. And I listed only some of the reasons for which many scientists are convinced that this is just uh, an obviously modern fake. And there has been uh, a discussion within the scientific communities, of course, only to declare this as fake as and remove it from the museum. But of course, this is not yet done. And some of the reasons quoted for not doing it is... Uh, losing revenue to the museum. So this was just uh, yet another reminder of how trustworthy are the mainstream stories. And if you believe them, then you can believe the story that uh, 12,000 years ago things were blown up and then some uh, simple people in Egypt found ruins and built simple things on the top of them. Do we know really so little about ancient Egypt actually? In reality, yes, but there is a good news that although we have uh, chosen to close our eyes 
for it, we still live in an absolutely magical world, exactly as magical as it was for the people who lived during dynastic times. And sometimes, for some people, magical bridges still open. A British-born woman, subsequently known by the nickname Om Seti, proved very well within the scientific community that she really has special sources for knowing things because number of times she revealed what is to be found during the excavations before the actual excavations took place and her source of knowledge was the pharaoh Seti I himself who used to initially speak to her on astral level and he revived a past life connection when he was a pharaoh she was a temple girl and they had a love affair which ended not so happily so initially seti the first being highly skilled in magic himself he could communicate with her on astral level and at later stages when she actually got divorced he even materialized in a human form of flesh to continue the love affair which they had long long time ago he used to do it by drawing power from the kundalini of her current human body as a result of that she aged prematurely by the way but anyhow that's a private story the question is, what did we do, the modern humans, after we had a verified case of somebody who could serve literally as a bridge to the past? Somebody who could ask questions directly to the pharaoh face to face? What did we do? The most suitable things we can do for being such superficial jellyfishes Absolutely nothing. I did not find a single hint anywhere that uh, after she was recognized by the scientific community that she was used or requested to channel any meaningful historic data except minor details on temple excavations. I mean, this is, this is just too little. Maybe because Om Seti herself, she studied mainstream Egyptology and I didn't find any hint that she doubted what she studied. So, um, from whatever data I found of what she said, she never had any doubts or really m much question to ask. Then what about the pharaoh himself? Was there an attempt on his side to communicate? Like? Any information on the history of Egypt? I mean, even if it confirms the mainstream history, any information? Not at all. He was on his personal visit to his lost lover. And when once, with her astral vis vision opened, she ended up in the treasury of the temple of Abydos, there was a small discussion about it. And he himself said that he is guarding it from being discovered. And not mainly because the riches would be, of course, stolen and will disappear in private collections or numbered boxes or whatever, it doesn't matter, it won't be for us. But his main concern was a book on very powerful practical magic. And he did not say that I don't want it to end up in the hands in that small group of bad people who govern your world. No, he said frankly, the people are not ready for this. And here I want to just add my personal experience of approaching the ancient spirits of the Amazon jungle. I wasn't that lucky to be able to get one of them to talk to me in an understandable language and answer all my questions but they did answer my prayers, prayers and showed me things and the very first and most important thing they showed me was how I was deceiving myself that I'm a good person because I'm a good person according to the modern standards we have about that but from angelic point of view I was terrible 
So right from very beginning they made it clear, if you're considering to apply for the magical world of the angels, you'll have to clean yourself according to the angelic standards and not according to the standards that you hear on TV. And I can guarantee you that this is the main problem for which we don't understand and we cannot understand how the Egyptians built all this, because their society was based on practical magic and we are like miles away from understanding even the basics of that. And the angels, they are not willing to come amongst us and teach us directly as they used to do. We are literally quarantined. We are literally quarantined by the keepers of the time, the keepers of the civilization on earth. We are like fenced in a very small cubicle of reality to experience how would it feel to live in a world with such distorted beliefs as the ones we have. Another genuine first-hand witness uh, report from ancient Egypt, I consider uh, the case of a young priestess which uh, has been described in detail in the books of, um, I believe, Brian Wise, which I have been recommended already so many times in my videos. They are available for free on internet. Another potential source of preserved ancient knowledge through oral tradition till current date used to be Abdul Hakim who passed a couple of decades ago. According to him, the ancient Egyptians used to call their land Kemet. That's why his disciples have uh, substituted Egyptology with Kemetology. In addition, what we call Egyptian hieroglyphs was actually a Sufi language, that's how the Kemets used to call it themselves. And according to him as well, this was a civilization which spread over continents, it wasn't a local thing. And he also described its fall down as a gradual rotting process from inside, during which the truth and the powerful Magic abilities were gradually subdued by corrupt priests. Hakim told his disciples, according to him, the true meaning of uh, many hieroglyphs and the true symbols for various things according to the commissions slash ancient Egyptians. But since, unfortunately, from what I can see so far, Forgive me, I'm not a specialist in this field of uh, chemistry that they have created practically an entire new branch of study. So, sadly, in this uh, lineage, it seems that most of the knowledge has been lost with time, and whatever has survived, like uh, meaning of magical symbols, doesn't seem to be enough to activate enough magical powers to create a really steady bridges through time with ancient Egypt to the degree that uh, an information will be channeled and then verified as accurate. Like a simple example, like with Om Seti. She said, dig and dig here and you will find this and that. And they dug and they found exactly the ruins she talked about. Another book which was recommended to me as a potential source of genuine knowledge is uh, the book Initiation, allegedly written by Elizabeth Hyde. So I started reading it and in the beginning it looked okay. Then I started noticing few funny moments which uh, made the story less and less credible. But then, when she started uh, quoting allegedly conversations and talks given by an ancient Egyptian priest, which were actually passages of Vedic teachings from India and other from the Buddhist world, then I realized this thing is just... this is not channeled from ancient Egypt. And by the way, in the preface it was implied that it is not even written by Elizabeth Hatch. 
Anyhow, and a few other dodgy things about that book. So, as an inspirational writing to encourage you to understand the astral, most definitely. But as information channeled from ancient Egypt, absolutely not. dating in terms of years, the way we understand them. It seems that many, if not all, of the allegedly very ancient Egyptian dynasties, three, four thousand years old, actually existed uh, after Christ, because there is so much Bible stuff on them, by which I don't imply even the slightest that the uh, glorious Egyptian civilization is younger in general. Because how far back in time it spreads, that we have no clue at all. We don't even have a clue if our method of understanding time was applicable then, back then, but more about that later. It seems that the situation of uh, the ruins which we are shown is something like uh, shown on this illustration, although this is a completely different style. We are shown only what is uh, on the top from the most recent dynasties and everything else is under ban. They just don't want to dig. There are laws in modern Egypt which restrict people very much even when they make graves for their dead relatives. Even then they have to dig only shallow graves, even if it is far away from any historic site. Even Local Egyptian historians and tour guides, they are also perplexed themselves. Uh, on one side, it's like we all want to know the history and then we don't dig even at places where we are sure to find ruins. And by the way, one of the reasons for which they are showing us relatively recent stuff and telling us that it is very, very old is to discourage us from inquiring into the really, really deep historic layers, because we have them all figured out. If you remember from the previous episodes, what did they find? 30 meters deep in the ground, cemetery of many, many red-haired Caucasian mummies. Oops, that, that's wrong, such things should not be found in Egypt. That's why digging is not allowed there. And this tacting of uh, putting much older dates to relatively recent sites, that is a very widely used trick. Now, some examples from other parts of the world. Look at this brickwork. Does it look like well over 2000 years old to you? That it's official dating, because this, my dear friends, is Babylon, the famous Babylon, before it got discovered. So at this point there is no question of reconstruction because this is like buried site. Yes, exactly buried, that's the impression uh, they are trying to create. Here they are giving even a description of uh, how hard were they digging. And yet on this photograph of the site before discovery, we see a slope here and a palm is growing on the slope. In other words, this brickwork was out there exposed to the elements. It wasn't dug out from the ground, but they're exaggerating how much were actually they digging and cleaning just to avoid this uncomfortable moment that if the work was indeed that old, it wouldn't be in such good condition. Now, this is a Sumerian ziggurat. Again, officially 
well over 2,000 years old. Again, an image taken at the time when no restoration has been done. Suspiciously high level of preservation of too many of the bricks. Loose bricks, piles on the right, just laying like that without any mortar. That would make them even more susceptible to erosion. And yet they look like as if somebody was just working on the construction here some decades ago, if not a couple of years ago, and for some reason they left. It really gives the overall impression of a recently abandoned construction site, not something that got destroyed. And again, this is an image at the time it was discovered, excavated. What kind of excavation? I mean, this, uh, at, this is absolutely ground level. The spare bricks are still lying around. Even that is not covered by what they call cultural layers. And yet thousands of buildings which are dated to very recent periods, like a couple of hundred years old, those are under five, six meters of cultural layers. That's how they call it. Actually, it's nothing else but clay, which again, according to mainstream sources, it's just like this byproduct of time, dust falls and things form. So why dust was not falling here for 2000 years? And let's get back to Egypt, where, as close as 1,000 years ago, still there was a very advanced culture. That date is uh, taken from a very reliable regression uh, record by Brian Wise. But when I say they were advanced, I really don't think uh, they had any electronics similar to ours a statement which is also based on um, various sources. And yet, although they didn't have our type of electronics, in general, I would call them more developed than us, even technologically, because they could accomplish more than us. In terms of uh, building convenient and beautiful homes, in terms of uh, healthcare, most definitely in terms of art, and in addition to that, they were far more informed than us in terms of cosmology. And as far as uh, when was dynastic Egypt founded or when was the Sphinx or the Great Pyramid built, I would say no reliable source at this time. And even, even we don't know if our way of counting and filling time was applicable back then. First of all, if you have listened to the interview with Peter Petrov, when I asked him about dating, he raised this point first. He said, I'm not even sure the time was uh, moving the way it does now. Because so many people, uh, so many clients, when he puts them under regression and uh, they get transported to another time, he asks them when is that, and when he goes in the older layers, people themselves often report that time was different, I can't tell you in your terms. So since the consciousness in which uh, the ancient Egyptians functioned was quite different from ours, maybe they had a different experience of time altogether. And this is not at all as far-fetched as it may sound to many. For example, I'm a pretty ordinary person, but uh, during shamanic uh, rituals and even sometimes during meditation, I have really experienced time in a very different way. Sometimes it went much faster. I mean, I accomplished things which usually take 15 minutes, but the clock showed one hour. Or in other cases, I did stuff during ritual, things which would uh, normally take me a couple of hours to accomplish, just to find out that it was only 10 minutes that were gone. And there was no uh, like boundary or any sort of change which I felt when I went into this other flow of time or when I came back. 
So since people were quite different back then, maybe their time was flowing in a different manner. Maybe we can't even calculate it with our years anyway. I received the following questions from viewers of the New York channel. They said, why don't you ask the spirit of Ayahuasca about the true history? Well, of course, why? Because she has shown no interest to communicate to me in a meaningful way such things. And I have tried to experiment with such uh, things with uh, really genuine shamans from the Amazon jungle. I mean like coming from hereditary uh, family of shamans and really people who can heal and not just brag. So a few times I tried to experiment and only once I could really reach to the point of, of the actual experiment on the other occasions, although I even had a native Spanish translator, yeah, university educated person from Lima, even he in his attempt to communicate to the jungles from the uh, shamans of the deep jungle, he said, I don't know what to tell you because it seems they speak Spanish because they like um, understand what I'm saying, but when they respond, it's as if they're uh, answering another question. So basically communication was impossible. And other people also before me have tried to like interview them or something like that. It has always been a total failure. So that's, that's like impossible. Uh, once I could uh, really explain to one of them what what are we doing and I really asked him like before we started I asked him do you see the spirit of ayahuasca when you are in ceremony he said of course and then I asked him when did you see her last when did you talk to her he said of course the last ceremony like as if it was self-evident Okay, and then I said, you ask her this and this and this, and then you tell me what she replied. He said, okay, why not, of course. But then when he was supposed to tell me the answers, uh, it turned out that he didn't understand very well the questions. Because, um, for example, on the, he, he doesn't understand what is a continent, Yeah, he comes from the jungle. He has some knowledge of what is the meaning of a country, but like continent and also the Shipibos, they their idea of time uh, spreads like around three to five days before and after the current moment. Before and after that is a gray zone for them. So I understood that uh, the answers that I'm getting are not like one-to-one -one words coming from a different being, but they were coming from himself. And then we started a long discussion of who said what and uh, why didn't you tell me the exact answer. And from this discussion, what I understood is that... Uh, they also cannot, uh, at least he, uh, could not really ask the spirit of ayahuasca in, let's say, Spanish or Shipibo and get a like clear answer which he could tell me word to word without interpreting. Just the concept of all this, we couldn't agree on what this scenario means even. But on the other hand... Um, 
because I worked with him on healing myself and other people, we also helped other people. When he asks this spirit for healing powers, there is tangible effect. People got miraculously healed. So I do believe him that he can connect to spirits. And I discussed with him many times. Do you speak with them in Spanish or Shipibo? And he every time has said yes. But yet we could never get it to the point of like transferring really information, even in Spanish. Now, why am I getting this question anyway on my channel is... Uh, because being a so-called channeling person has become a very popular profession in the New Age spheres. And um, from the experiments I have done with this type of people, it seems the situation is like this. They have some uh, sort of um, astral experience, which, by the way, constantly happens to all people practically like prophetic dreams but let's say people who are uh, stubbornly atheistic they may even uh, see a given event in a dream and then it may happen to them in a week or in a year and they will dismiss it as funny coincidence so it happens to all people but when it happens to some uh, certain new age people they convince themselves that from today on their channels and everything they say is seen with the divine vision from i don't know some other galaxy or something like that and in many cases i see that these are people who are not bad and they have no intention of deceiving others but it happens anyway because they first deceive themselves and then they just say what they believe in and all this is ultimately fueled again by the mass media, the movie industry, which have um, implanted in us this very cunning lie that spiritual people believe in nonsense, they are irrational. And whatever nonsense, nonsense you think that you're spiritual then. Like, for example, in the famous... Uh, show friends like the lady who is inclined to, to spirituality she's often portrayed as fool who can't really put two and two together like recently i spoke with somebody and um, as we were talking he mentioned wow i'm shocked i thought you're a spiritual person but you're actually so deeply materialistic and I asked him, why do you think so? And he said, it's because you always try to verify things. And that's not for spiritual people. Spiritual people, they just believe things. Don't, don't you know that? person who believes things without any ground or discrimination is a moron, a total fool. So sadly, so many people put an equation mark between moron and spiritual person nowadays. Well, historically, the shamans with astral vision, they were the wisest. They were the keepers of the real knowledge about how reality works, which is exactly the opposite of what a moron is. So as we start to straighten our ideas of what is what and uh, what is actually spirituality is not being a fool it's about having advanced knowledge and after we correct thousands of similar misunderstandings that we have they come usually in groups one nonsense confirming the other after we clean all this garbage then we will be capable of understanding how was life in ancient Egypt. And then Seti I will no longer hide his treasury from us. Because after Om Seti had a vision of the treasury compound, they started searching for it. And with some sort of um, devices for penetrating and making images, they, by the way, 
found a, a cavity or room which was exactly of the size and description as mentioned by Om Seti. But surprisingly enough for many people, and not at all surprisingly for me, always something happened and they could never actually get to that room. Uh. 